Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. I'm going to present both sides of this. You've heard all of this or almost all of this. I'm just gonna put it together in a slightly different way for you today and hopefully be short about the whole thing. The disclaimer, I think this new disclaimer that any trade or brand names for products mentioned during the presentation are for your training and identification purposes only. My disclosure and those brand names are that only Truvada, Discovi, and Apritude are approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and only for use in some but all, not all populations. And I put this last disclaimer that we may talk about other things in here because often we do. I'm just going to give you the resources for the uh, new-ish PrEP guidelines that came out at the very end of last year, the IAS USA guidelines that came out a year or so ago, and then the PrEP line, of course, and you are always welcome to ask me questions about PrEP or about testing. So I just want to review why we're talking about this, and it's really because the guidelines, the CDC guidelines, changed the testing that we have been doing for years. And the CDC guidelines have a few typos in them, typos or or conflicting stuff. And I've seen people present the wrong information in the last month. So I just want to make sure we're all clear. So the guidelines now have two different sets of tables, whether we're talking about oral prep, that's FTC TDF and FTC TF versus injectable prep. What I'm showing you on this slide is the summary of the guidance for daily oral prep. My little arrows are, which I think you can see, are to say that when people are starting PrEP, the recommendation is to do an HIV antigen antibody test, ideally from the lab, ideally within one week before starting PrEP. And then the second one is that in follow-up visits new for the PrEP guidelines is that we're supposed to be doing antigen antibody testing and RNA testing. Not just RNA testing, but both antigen antibody testing. For injectable cabotegravir, the recommendation is to do a antigen antibody test and an RNA test both before starting PrEP and during follow-up. You can see here that they have not included the RNA test in the baseline, but it is a recommendation both in the guidelines somewhere else, and I think here, it's very clear that it's in the guidelines as both an antigen antibody test and an RNA test. Um, I guess, actually, this is in follow-up. And then the, the guidance from the approval by the FDA of this medicine requires a test for acute HIV infection in one place, but also specifies RNA testing. So RNA testing is specified by the FDA approval of injectable cabotegravir and both antigen and antibody testing and RNA testing are recommended at every visit for individuals on injectable PrEP. This is just the flowchart from the CDC guidelines that just say the same thing, so I'm not gonna go into that. But again, antigen, antibody, and RNA testing. And the reason for this is that when we're thinking about early HIV infection, this is nothing new. We know that there is a longer window period for antigen antibody testing compared to RNA testing. So you've, if you've seen me talk about testing before, you've seen the slide. I'm not showing you any of the animations. This slide is oriented to be how many days tests turn positive before the Western blot. So all of these data were collected by CDC in order to justify changing the guidelines, which are now almost a decade old for HIV testing to recommend more sensitive testing. And so, you know, in the era where we wanted to have very specific testing, we wanted uh, tests that could be confirmed by the Western blot. In the modern testing era, we want a highly sensitive test able to pick up acute HIV infection. So the first tests that can pick up acute HIV are, of course, the tests for nucleic acids, which appear about one to two weeks after someone gets infected. 
And then the data suggests that it's about three to five days between when the nucleic acid tests can identify HIV and when antigen antibody testing can in the laboratory. As you've heard me talk probably about point of care tests, there is probably about another week when those first antigen antibody tests uh, in that are point of care antigen antibody tests can pick up HIV. So using antigen antibody testing alone will miss a small number of people who are in the window period. And that's the rationale for better baseline testing and why we're in general recommending using HIV tests with the shortest windows possible when you have populations that are likely to have recently acquired HIV. We've also known well before this that PrEP can delay detection of HIV, even in the oral PrEP era. Marcel Curlin, who was previously with the University of Washington and did this in his role in Southeast Asia. So he published a summary of delayed diagnosis associated with PrEP and noted that in those studies that were using oral fluid tests, that there may have been a delay in detecting HIV infection for over one year. And then Deborah Donnell from the Partners PrEP study found also that PrEP was associated with a longer time to detection in finger stick point of care testing. But things really changed with injectable PrEP. And so this is data also that I've shown and, and Rafi Landovich showed when he talked looking at injectable PrEP. This is data from HPTN, the HIV Prevention Trials Network study 083, looking at the median delay between when the site identified HIV using predominantly an antigen antibody laboratory-based test and the number of days when they did a look back, how many days before had that person actually had detectable HIV RNA. And there were, I think, 11 of these folks, four of them who were truly HIV infection, had acute HIV and were missed by the antigen antibody test. And they had a median viral load, log viral load of 4.4, so four zeros as about um, 10,000, 30,000 copies. And they were first detected by the study teams about two months later after having gotten oral uh, cabotegravir and then at least one cabotegravir injection after they were clearly infected. Of the people who were truly HIV negative at the time of starting PrEP who received cabotegravir injections, there was similarly a delay of, on average, the median was about three months from when, in the look back, someone had a first positive test to when the site actually detected HIV. Interestingly, not all of these were detectable by the quantitative assays. So not all of them could have been picked up on routine HIV screening using HIV RNA testing, but at least some of them would have been. And then of note is a number of these folks continued to receive CAB injections after they were infected, noted to be infected in that look back. And then the question, of course, is could the folks who acquired resistance to the integrase inhibitors, could we have prevented that? And that is, of course, one of the arguments for doing this testing, that you can identify HIV sooner and there is a consequence to missing HIV infection in these folks, and perhaps you could prevent it by not giving these individuals additional injections. One of the things that I'm going to bring up in a bit is that these 11 represent 0.2% of the thousands of folks who were in the study, so relatively small proportions. But it's not only CAB that the CDC recommended the guidelines change to do RNA testing, and people now are questioning why the recommendations are to do RNA testing, not at baseline in oral prep, but in the follow-up period. And there are two bits of data that explain that. The first is that in that 083 study, there was a a similar delay, not quite as long, for individuals who were receiving oral PrEP, who were had recently been infected and who were missed at the study site and who continued to receive oral PrEP prescriptions. 
The look back, people had not been infected as long. By the time they were detected at the site, it was about one month. Rafi will say that the, the one month is really about when the study visits were happening. That being said, it was a uh, one month. It was shorter than the two and three months that were seen with injectable cabotegravir. Uh, similarly, many of these folks continued to receive oral PrEP even after they were HIV positive, and several of them had drug resistance that could have been attributed to continued oral PrEP. Of course, there was an interesting a number of NNRTI. I think it was like 20% of this group acquired NNRTI mutations as well. So some of it was transmitted drug resistance because, of course, they weren't receiving NNRTIs in OA3. But the second little bit of data is something strange that I can't figure out, but this is this one of the stated reasons why the CDC guidelines include RNA testing for oral PrEP. What I'm showing you is data from the Thai group in their acute HIV screening. So this group for years has been doing really aggressive ways associated with the Red Cross and the military to try and identify individuals with acute HIV infection. And so they do simultaneous uh, antigen antibody and RNA screening. There's a lot of money being spent to identify folks. If people are negative, they may go on PrEP. And what this table shows you are six of seven people who were started on PrEP because they were presumed to be negative, but they were truly infected at the time of starting PrEP. There was a seventh person who didn't consent to longitudinal follow-up and is not included in this. These data were presented at CROI, the Conference of Retroviruses and Opportunistic Opportunistic Infections in 2021, and I haven't seen it published yet. But the thing that is strange here is that in these individuals at baseline that week zero and at 24 continued to have negative antigen antibody tests. And it was a combination of two different antigen antibody tests that are available here. So they're reliable tests done in the laboratory, not point of care tests, but they missed most of these infections that were seemed to have been picked up by um, the 2G and 3G represent what previously were called second generation and third generation. So antibody only testing, in fact, sometimes insensitive antibody only tests. And I haven't seen a good explanation for why these folks were thought to have been missed when the, I will say, less good tests picked them up. And just to go back to this slide that I showed you a little bit ago is that we have lots of data from frozen specimens, um, primarily, that the window period for what I have outlined in this red box, that is the same uh, antibody-only test. It's testing for HIV-1, 2, and O. That that window period is reliably longer than the antigen antibody tests, including the one that was used partially in the study. Similarly, um, there's data from San Francisco from their group who looked at retrospective testing of their acute HIV infections, and I don't think I have this boxed, but again, you can see that the the architect, which was the antigen antibody test, picked up most of their cases that were antibody negative and already positive, and the the test that is an antibody only test performed much worse. So again, I'm going to just pop back to this to say, I can't explain this, but this is partially why the CDC um, justified the use of RNA testing in oral prep. But for me, the real issue is cost and cost effectiveness and sort of why my confusion over this. And I just want to run through, I am not a modeler, but just my back of the envelope cost effectiveness of why when I come out on this issue, I don't think this was the right recommendation either for CAB or for oral PrEP. And then, of course, the the new thing that I'm going to tell you today is that I'm starting to hear that um, payers are actually refusing to cover this, even though it's supposed to be all screening associated with HIV. HIV testing and PrEP is supposed to be covered because of the USPSTF grade A recommendation. They are not. And I know I'm, I'm running out of time, so I just want to quickly come to, you know, my assumptions that if they're on OA3, 
we pay $164 per RNA test. There were 22 and change participants randomized to CAB that if they had, for baseline, there were four participants that were missed. That comes out to about $100,000 per case identified, which we in public health estimate, you know, about ten dollars to $20,000 per case identified. So not cost effective for baseline testing. And then the total follow-up because of the number of RNA tests that are required is going to cost $3 million to identify those folks. Again, you're testing thousands of people to find a certain number of participants who are have acute HIV and are missed by antigen antibody testing. There were 11 of such folks. Again, about half of them acquired resistance. This is the rationale for doing RNA testing, not just we're going to find more cases, but we're going to be able to prevent the NCD resistance. And this is a about $700,000 per case identified. Again, this is my bad math. So, so, you know, I'm hoping that someone actually is doing this work because, and it's unclear if you could have prevented that. So the numbers are sort of similar for oral prep. It's actually a little bit better for resistance prevented. Of course, the concern is, or the difference is that maybe this, the 184s may not be as relevant. And so it may not be worth it at any cost. And then the, the paper that's just been published that includes Rochelle Walensky uh, was presented a few years ago at CROI again, was that, um, and this was prior to availability, so they estimated the price of CAB for this cost effectiveness, and they said that the incremental cost effectiveness ratio for using CAB over oral prep, so this is not about RNA testing, this is about CAB in general, but use of CAB is not going to be cost effective in any way using that $100,000 threshold per quality adjusted life years compared with a generic prep unless CAB is under about a $4,000 per year and currently list is about $3,700 per dose. And that reference there. I'm going to stop here and see if there are any questions, but that's my, my sort of takeaway of the data. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.